Okay, we're live, and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and we are here tonight for the epic debate, the main event between Dr. Kent Hoven and Mark Reed. Tonight, we are debating the topic Noah's Ark and Noah's Flood, fact or fiction. Mark and Kent, thank you so much for giving us your time for this epic, epic debate. Thank you, Donnie. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now, uh, before we get some introductions and kind of get to know the debaters a little bit, I want to remind everybody that uh, today is the, the the first part of kind of a two-day event. Tomorrow, we've got another epic debate, a creation-related debate. We've got Dr. Kenny Rhodes back here with us. He debated Dr. Hoven a few weeks back. He'll be deb debating uh, Matt Powell, Young Earth Creation versus Young Earth Creation. So Old Earth Creation versus Young Earth Creation. So that's going to kick off same time. 8 EST. So that being said, let's get to know the debaters a little bit. Uh, Kent, you've been here before many times before. Mark, you've been here before as well. Uh, two seasoned debaters. So why don't we start with uh, Dr. Hoven. Thanks for being here. How's everything going on over at Dell? Oh, thank you for having me again. Oh, God is good. Some of God's kids drive me crazy, but God is good. Um, Donna Sir Richard Land is busy. People coming from all over the world to visit our place. and it's been amazing. We've got 179 baptized in our lake now. And we just keep winning souls and building stuff. And it's amazing. Come down, you've got to come visit. Well, they won't let you out of Canada, will they? The Canadians can't get out of your <laughs> hostage in your own country. Uh, but anyway, yeah, pretty uh, well. Doing very well. Building the whole thing. Been five years now, and uh, we're loving it here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Kent, for your introduction. And you've got a big event coming up, don't you? Next month or in a couple months, you got all the atheists from around the world coming over to Dal to take you on. Isn't that right? I've invited them. Hope they come. Yeah, they're all welcome. <laughs> Mark, maybe we'll see you there. <laughs> no, I doubt it's a long way for me to go. <laughs> so, Mark, uh, thank you as well for giving us your time for this debate. I know it's really early in the morning for you all the way in Australia. So I appreciate a little bit about yourself for the audience, Mark. Oh, yeah, I'm just um, I'm just a average Internet denizen uh, getting on and debating. Um, I think I think seasoned debater is a bit of a stretch, to be honest with you, as this is my fourth debate or something. But I really enjoy it. I, I love uh, talking to people. And um, yeah, generally, I, I do have a, uh, a YouTube account. I'll, I'll send it over to you. Um, and that's really and Amy Newman's channel is where you will usually find me lurking around uh, asking very, very difficult questions. So I'd love to see more people over there and love to see you all. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can we can answer some of those questions I have. Awesome. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Well, before I get into the format, actually, um, Dr. Hoven, I'm not sure on your end if you can turn up the volume a little bit. A couple of people in the chat were saying your your audio is not quite as uh, as loud as usual. OK, how's that? Testing one, two, three. I tried right. Uno, dos, tres, siete, okay, some say, better there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, no. And the other three, that's a dependent, okay. I would, say, I would say that's an improvement on my end. Uh, what about you? Okay. <laughs> yep, yep, I can I can hear. Uh, can't loud and clear. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Well, that being said, then get the, we got those issues out of the way. So format for tonight, we've got 12 minute opening statements. Mark's going to be uh, kicking us off with his opening statement. Then we've got uh, roughly six to eight minute rebuttals. Then we're going to have an open discussion where the debaters are asking each other uh, questions relevant to the topic. We're going to keep it, of course, as always, cordial and equally timed. Then we're going to have five minute closing statements and then an audience Q&A. So that's where you guys get involved. Please tag me at Standing for Truth. That makes it a little more easy for me to see your question and I can save them. So that being said, let's get right into it. Mark, we're going to hand you the, the floor. You have uh, up to 12 minutes. Whatever you don't use, we'll put into the discussion portion. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Now, I want to thank uh, Kent for being here and Danny for Truth for, for moderating. And of course, the audience for being here, listening in and, you know, hearing what I have to say and uh, hearing the the sort of arguments back and forth. Now, today we're talking about the Ark, which um, is one of the sort of more baffling stories for me. It's, it's one of the more kooky stories in the Bible. Um, my position is that I think that it is a, a legend, a myth, and, and it fulfills all the criteria of a myth. Um, so a lot of it should be 
sort of realized and a lot of christians do realize that a lot of it is hyperbole and sort of metaphor that it's a, it's a symbolic story of a culture not really a actual historic account of events and i have a number of questions of of, of how it could work if it was to be a historic uh, account of events um, and i'll go through some of those and hopefully um kent can clear up what how how this would work as there seems to be you know a lot of holes in the boat if you'll forgive the rather terrible pun um so firstly uh the construction of the ark and how it would actually uh fare in a cataclysmic ocean um the it was made by um a, a very prestigious shipwrights in in maine uh, uh sorry uh it was made by by noah and the the i do apologize i skipped ahead there um and it was um 140 37 meters long 23 meters wide and 14 meters high of course in you know a different different uh, system back then um now when a ship becomes that big and we can compare it to sort of modern ish ships um uh, that that were of a similar size um a, a theory a principle called beam theory kicks in and that means that when you increase the size of the, the planks the structural integrity and the strength of the beam does not increase to to match what it, the weight it needs to hold um, and it leads to a fragile hull um, this there was problems with other ships of this size and what what the planks would do on a ship that big was they couldn't maintain their integrity and they would twist and warp in in the water um, and the the ship that i was talking about earlier the wyoming um, i do apologize i did skip ahead the Wyoming was built by the finest shipyard uh, yards in uh, in Maine uh, from a firm Percy and Small. It was 140 meters in length, so a very similar size to the Ark, um, and it could not go into open water. It was basically confined to the shallows because of this twisting of the planks that would occur. Um, it eventually founded and sank, um, but it it was always known to have problems with water coming in and and it had to use bilge pumps which obviously weren't available to noah um and my question would be how could it possibly deal with that water um, that would come in from a ship that size um, there are other ships uh when i say ships they're more barges that are that size wooden barges um, and they have exactly the same problem that their, their planks twist and warp let water in and they need bilge pumps and steel reinforcement um, to stay afloat um, and you know technically you could have people bailing um, you know the old bucket heave over the side uh, method but there are some massive problems with this and, and I will get to that later um, physics itself seems to have problems with the global flood narrative and that's really what I'm putting up as in dispute uh, the sort of universal flood um, when when um, you increase the size of water um, and, and it rises all around the world um, and I think it was Dr Stern that pointed this out it would compress the atmosphere now this compression of the atmosphere if, if you do no physics if you compress air it heats up to a, to a rather large degree in fact and the rising of the atmosphere would compress everything to such a degree that it would burn to a crisp anything in that atmosphere and, and so my second question is how, how did how did the, the the waters rise if the waters rising would would burn everything um i i really am uncertain about how that would work um as, as a sort of menagerie of animals noah's ark absolutely fails there, there is no possible way you could get the amount of animals on board and and let's have a look at the the um, animals because it's incredibly vague how many there are. And I think I think the most generous estimate I found on on board is about ten thousand animals. Um, it would be impossible to get those animals um, on on board the ark with the space that it had. So I'm very curious as to how um, this this uh, 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 tardis of an ark managed to fit everything on board. And that brings me to the problems with the amount of people there were. Eight people were aboard the ark, according to the myth, and 10,000 animals. Now, um, that would be well over a thousand animals each to take care of. Now, according to 
a couple of sources that I read, uh, an average zookeeper can, can handle about 25 animals, um, you know, take care of them, clean them, clean out all the fecal matter, do all of the uh, care required um, for, for, for animals. Now, uh, let's just say they were excellent workers, um, you know, and double it to 50. And let's just say that they worked 16 hours a day with no rest and, and double it again to 100. And let's just, I don't know, double it again, because why not? Like, let's just say they there was something going on that we didn't know about and say 200 animals. They still took care of five times that amount. There is no human on this planet that can take care solo over a thousand animals you know if you really think about it that is beyond the capacity of any human and we see this a lot in myths like the flood sort of humans with supernatural abilities to do things and and this is one of the reasons why it's widely considered a myth um and and another problem is what did these these thousand animals you're taking care of what what did they eat um you've got carnivores like like lions and tigers um, that they couldn't feed on prey because every time they did they would make something go extinct um, they would have to have meat because that's what the order carnivora eats exclusively um, there's also kestrels and eagles and hawks they they, they couldn't hunt prey um, they're not uh, uh, seed eating birds what did they eat um, they they have to have fresh meat and meat does not keep very well on a leaky boat, I'm afraid. Um, so I have a number of questions about that. Um, things like bees gathering pollen and nectar. How did they possibly do that? Uh, I do apologize, just one second. Um, yeah, uh, things like dragonflies, which, which hunt other insects. How did they do that if they, they exterminate a species every time they caught something? There's a number of questions about the uh, the diet of, of animals. Um, koalas, for instance, to bring it back to my neck of the woods, um, they, they feed exclusively on eucalyptus leaves, exclusively. They can't eat anything else. So the question becomes, how did the eucalyptus trees get to the near mid east? Uh, I, I don't understand how Noah managed to get his hands on you know, such a vast forest of eucalyptus leaves to keep the koalas alive. Um, it's all very mysterious. Um, so there's fantastic physics and geology and circumstance and, you know, ex exceptional things that show that there was no global flood. There may have been, I, I will concede there may have been a local flood. Um, I know that's not sort of what we're debating, but um, a global flood is, is pure fantasy. Um, most Christians, including Carol A. Hill, who is a, is a Christian geologist, she has been for 40 plus years, she wrote in an article, absolutely no geologic evidence exists for the canopy theory, flood geology, or a universal flood. So nearly all geologists, even very, very devout Christian ones, don't believe in a global flood. So what, what I think has happened in the more likely story is legend building, sort of a, a small sort of localized flood that was exaggerated over time. Sort of, you know, a, a man could have saved a couple of animals and, you know, which turned into many animals over the retelling. And we know this happens over retelling stories become more aggrandized and larger and details added. Um, I mean, it's, it's one thing to say you caught a huge fish. It becomes so much more credible when you say the fish was exactly, you know, four feet long kind of thing. We know that people do this. Um, so, you know, a few animals over time gets retold and retold and becomes many animals and then becomes all the animals in the land. And by the time it gets written down, it's all the animals in the world. There's nothing strange about that and nothing, nothing that we see wrong about that in growing with the, in scope with the retelling. Um, either that or a boat that would lack that would leak and, and, and founder would have, would have been in an ocean that could not have risen, carrying animals that could not have, have survived, serviced by a crew that could not handle the workload. Um, and don't forget the crew would also have to clean, cook, maintain the boat, do every chore aboard such a massive vehicle. 
as well as over a thousand animals. Um, it, it just, to me, it is. It seems one of the more kooky stories in the Bible, just because of the um, the sheer amount of holes and the sort of, uh, to me, the ridiculousness of those holes. No, nothing about it um, is is very plausible at all. Um, and so I know which one out of these these ideas that I would believe. It is simply a myth. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate it there. Uh, Mark, with one minute to spare, we can definitely throw Oof. that into discussion portion. So you, uh, you made it, you made it. Uh, also to the chat, thank you so much for your support, your super stickers, super chats. We've already got over 200 people in the chat. So please, when you do tag me with your question, just make sure you're tagging me at Standing for Truth. So that being said, we're gonna hand it over to you, Kent. Kent, you have uh, 12 minutes as well, whenever you're ready. Well, thank you. And uh, Mark, I appreciate this. Now, I have a simple question. If I can, I plug all these holes you have <clears throat> about the art, would you then get converted or would you simply start looking for more holes? Uh, I agree. Um, uh, most people I debate, they don't really want an answer. They want to reject the Bible for some whatever reason. Okay. So if you're really honestly seeking for truth, then I think all of your questions can easily be answered. Uh, scientifically, biblically, no question. Uh, either way or both. And uh, but I, I, just for warning up front, I suspect, it, like many atheists I've debated, you don't really want an answer, and it wouldn't matter what I told you. But let me answer a few of these. The Bible says the earth was corrupt and filled with violence, and God looked down, and everything was corrupt. And God said to Noah, I want you to build a boat because the earth is filled with violence, and I want you to make it with gopher wood. So the story of Noah's Ark <clears throat> has been found in cultures all over the world. If you look at the time frame, according to the Bible, I've got a chart here made straight from the dates in the Bible. The first half of the chart uh, from the creation up until the flood is the dates that are found before in Genesis chapter 5. They're all given right there, Genesis 5. <clears throat> it tells how old they are when their kids were born and uh, the, how long they lived after that. Before the flood came, according to the Bible, people were living to be 900 years old. This is the time of dinosaurs because reptiles never stop growing. Many giant fossils are found of all kinds of animals. Biggest beaver today is about two and a half feet. They find fossil beavers eight feet long. Something was different. Now, the textbooks in school are going to say, oh, this is during the you know, prehistoric Archean era, something like that. There's no such thing as a geologic column. There's no such thing as a Jurassic period or Triassic or Mississippian, Devonian, Silurian. It's all baloney. All the layers are the same age. How can they not be? They say the top layer is younger. I say, really? Where's it coming from? Outer space? All the layers are the same age, every speck of dirt. Anyway, so before the flood came, the Bible says they lived to be 900, including Noah was 950. After the flood, the dates are found in Genesis chapter 11. So after the flood, we see Noah had a son named Shem, and Shem lived to be 600 years old. The dark line going up and down is, is the flood. After the flood, we have Shem having a son named Arphaxed. And I'm sure our facts said born after the flood would soon get big enough and he'd look around and say, hey, dad, are we the only people in the world? And dad would say, yes, son, let me tell you about the flood. And that story would be told. Shem himself, who lived through the flood, lived long enough to tell the story to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I think the actual eyewitness account of Noah, who lived 400 and some years, uh, or 350 years after the flood, but they would tell this story. There have been 270 flood stories, according to this book by Dwayne Gish. Flood legends. After the death of Kunihana in Hawaii, the legend goes, the first man, uh, the world became a wicked, terrible place. There was a place, there was one good man left whose name was Nu'u, according to the Hawaiian legend. He made a great canoe with a house on it filled with animals. And I cover all this in my video number three of my seminar series. You can get the whole thing for 50 bucks and watch video number three. I talk about dinosaurs. They've always lived with man. And... A whole bunch about the flood and actually dr hoven i'm just going to pause your timer real quick because i i noticed and some people notice in the chat that the mic you're using is the computer mic versus your external mic now i don't want to risk anything and, and screw it off they got a red light on my mic again now we can still hear you it's just coming from the okay uh, it switched computer. over this thing turned red which indicates the world's going to come to an end in 20 minutes <laughs> What do we do? Keep going? You got another battery? Hold on, it's coming. Okay. What's coming? Another battery? Should there take it? Is. Okay. Green light. All right. There we go. What an improvement. There's a proof okay, for good. evolution right there. <laughs> so there you go.
Oh, and actually now we're not getting any sound from Ken. So it was coming perfectly and now the sound's off. It looks like it's red again on the, on the external mic. It was coming in for a couple seconds there, whoever's in charge of the external mic, but it uh, then we lost. So, there we go. How's that? Testing one, two, three. There we go. Green you're light. back. Red light, yeah, green light. Green okay. Again, Keep back. an eye on that there. Okay. I guess the point would be there are hundreds of flood legends from countries around the world. Are they all just making up a story? Or could it be that these are, you know, exaggerated versions, as, as he said, of, of the real thing? The Chinese have a legend that says Fu Hai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped, escaped a flood, and they survived in a big boat. Uh, the Tolik Indians in Mexico have a legend about a flood. They say the first world lasted 1,716 years. Well, that's interesting. The Bible dates add up to 1656, so pretty close for a legend like that. They say the world was destroyed by a flood that covered the highest mountains, and one family survived. So the Bible dates come to 1656. So I think a legend that's only you know 80 years off after being retold and retold is pretty good. Uh, let's see. There's a website called creationism.org that has a list of all of the flood legends and uh, all the information about them, if you want to go read about that. Now, we have uh, here at the Dinosaur Venture Land a rock tumbler. You stick rocks in there and just tum tumble them around for a few days, drive your parents nuts, and they come out rounded. Rock tumbler. Worldwide. Gravel is rounded. We live in a gravel pit here in Lenox, Alabama. We have trillions of rounded rocks. Rocks that are rounded off had to be tumbled around. The seven layers of gravel here in Lenox, Alabama that they were digging for, these gravel layers, go all the way to North Carolina. Same layers. I think there was a flood to make rounded rocks in layers like this, seven consecutive layers. It's gravel, sand, clay, which is the, come take the tour, and I will show you around how that, that happens. We got a de science demonstration on that. At the far end of the country of Turkey, there's a mountain over there called Noah on Gumshi. The Turkish government has signs. You go drive right up to it. They say this is where Noah's Ark landed. The Bible says it landed in the mountains of Ararat, mountains plural. Four theories about Noah's Ark, what happened to it, if the story's true. Some people say they took it apart because after the flood, there wouldn't be very many big trees around to build stuff out of, so they reused the lumber. Reasonable theory. Second theory says it rotted, it's made out of wood, it's gone. Third theory says it's still on the mountain. And fourth theory says it's down in the valley. I stick with number four. I think it's down in the valley. Here's, the, here's actual Mount Ararat. I, I think it's unlikely for anything to land on a mountain. If water's receding, it's going to be drift off to the side. Float a sponge in your bathtub and bring your knee up under it and try to get it to land on your knee. It's going to be very difficult. It's going to drift off to one side or the other. Green light. Okay. Uh, so some people think it's on the mountain. I disagree. I think it's, I don't think that's it. I think it's right there. Turkish government says that's it. The Life magazine published an article 60 years ago. said that's Noah's Ark right there. That's the remnants of it. There was an earthquake in 78 that made it, either it came up or the ground fell down. But that's apparently what's Noah's, left of Noah's Ark. It's in the right spot. It's in the mountains of Ararat where the Bible says it landed. Uh, Richard Reeves and uh, David Reeves, his son, good friends of mine, They've been done a lot of study on that. The ark apparently has collapsed on itself and folded out to the side. Radar scans show that there are giant timbers down there. This indeed, is, and, and, and the, bolt, the ark was apparently bolted together with giant rivets. Noah was 600 when he went on the boat. He's probably a pretty smart fellow by then. He'd figure out how to do things. Plus, God showed him how to build the boat. But they found some of the rivets, iron rivets, that apparently the ark was bolted together, riveted together, okay? It was apparently made of, of three layers of wood that are stuck together by tar. The Bible says they used pitch. I saw a sample of it they've got at the museum in Tennessee. It was about four and a half inch thick, like, like plywood, only this thick. That would be incredibly strong. Cross grain, like that. You can go see Wyatt Archaeological Museum and see all the pictures. Apparently, the ark landed up near the mountain, and over the years, over the centuries, the rainstorms and landslides and things have pushed it down. It tore the bottom of the ark off, which is called the keel. Most ships have a heavy keel on the bottom to keep it upright. You keep, you know, put a bunch of rocks in the in the, something hanging off the bottom to keep the ship upright in stormy weather. Apparently, that got ripped off because it's still up there near the mountain, and the boat has slid down now down here. So you can watch my video for three for more on that. 
I did want to address some of your questions, uh, Dave, on the assumption that you really want an answer. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, God, God gave the instructions on how to do it, and Noah was 600 when the flood started, so he probably spent 100 years building that boat. We don't know. But <clears throat> he certainly could have hired local help if he wanted. And yes, the Bible teaches clearly it was a global flood. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised, uh, Mark, that you said, one of the things you said, I said, you got to be kidding. You said the rising ocean would compress the air. How on earth did you get, come up with that conclusion? If the ocean rises, it lifts the air with it. Rising oceans has zero effect on air pressure. None. The ocean, the air is going to go up with it. It's not going to heat up the world from the heating, heating of the air. Study some physics on that one, uh, Mark. I'm sorry. And you said, there's no way to get all the animals on the ark. 10,000. Let's take that number. You used 10,000. That's reasonable. First of all, Noah was 600. He was probably smart enough to know to bring babies. He only had to bring two of each kind. There's a website called barominology.com from the Hebrew word baramin, which is, deals with what is a, a kind. God said bring them after their kind on the ark. And to put this in perspective now, uh, for all of you guys watching, I want you to understand that people like, like Mark want to reject the flood story, which is their privilege. But instead, they want you to believe everything fit in a dot smaller than a period. You don't believe all these animals could fit on a boat, but you think all the animals in the world fit in a dot that exploded. Stop and think. And I, it boggles the mind that they can believe this evolution religion. They have traded in a Bible story for something so dumb to believe in evolution. Anyway, the government of Turkey built a visitor center over there. You can go see Noah's Ark if you'd like. <clears throat> right there. Okay. 300 cubits long, cubit elbow to fingertip. That would make the boat, uh, with my cubit at least, 20.62 uh, inches is the standard Hebrew cubit or Egyptian cubit. That'd make the boat about 515 feet long. And that is indeed the size of that, a little bigger than the Titanic. Uh, and as far as uh, keeping the boat uh, in stormy weather, we don't know that where the flood was when Noah was in the ark, it was stormy at all. You, you, people always assume, oh, the rough seas and are going to tear the ark apart. Well, maybe it was perfectly calm the whole time, just float, land, and get out. We don't know that there was a storm. But in case there was or any currents moving things around, they, apparently they, they were moon, there were uh, uh, rocks hanging on the side of the boat. Drogue stones, they're called. They found, uh, I think, 12 of these giant rocks, 9,000 pounds apiece. They have a hole in the top. They call them anchor stones. There's carvings on them. Apparently, when Noah got off or somebody carved on there, eight crosses for eight people on Noah's Ark. These holes have curves in them, indicating they were to hold a rope without a sharp edge to cut the rope. Uh, at the Sea of Galilee, they find boats had anchor stones or drogue stones. If it gets windy or stormy, drop the rocks overboard. And... It would keep the boat stabilized like a sea anchor, something to anchor to the water, if you can use that analogy. So the ark landed, the ropes were taken off, the anchor stones, and then the ark has slid down over the centuries, and now it's several miles away from these things. So apparently these were the rope holes for the anchor stones, called a drogue stone. If it does really get windy, they will create drag and turn the boat so you're always perpendicular to the waves. It would be a, a smart idea to have drogue stones hanging off the boat to slow you down, if you're not going anywhere anywhere. Uh, one guy said Noah's Ark having rocks on the side would slow him down. I said, where was he going? <laughs> He's not trying to go anywhere. He's just trying to float. But <clears throat> they said there was a 600, uh, six master that couldn't sail because the, the sails kept twisting the ships. You mentioned the planks twisting. Noah's Ark didn't have any sails. It's just a, simply a design to float. The uh, book of Josephus, I got two or three copies back there. They had written about the time of Christ. <clears throat> they said, oh, yeah, we know where Noah's Ark is. It's called the landing place in Armenia. And about the Ark going over waves, again, we don't know that there was any stormy weather where Noah was. But if there was, the Ark going over a boat like, uh, or the going over a big wave, a boat that long, would tend to twist and flex, unless it had a moon pool. It's common sense. A moon pool is a hole in the floor into which the water can come up and down. You have walls built up inside. And... As you go over the waves, this relieves the stress on a long ship, and it acts like a giant piston to pump air in and out of the boat, and a good place to get your fresh water. I believe the whole world was fresh water during Noah's flood, and all the water has gradually become saltier. We know the oceans are gaining salt every day, and they're, today they're 3.6% average salt salinity in the ocean. And so that could have happened in 4,400 years easily, go from fresh water. 
And you mentioned about the carnivorous animals on the ark. Let's see. I think I've got that. Uh, evidence for Noah's flood. Uh, the Bible clearly teaches it, first of all. Jesus believed it. There are 350 flood legends, and 70% of the earth is still covered by water. One atheist I debated said, if there was a flood, where'd all the water go? It's still here. The oceans are huge. If you smoothed out the world today, there's enough water out there to cover the earth a mile and a half deep everywhere, 8,000 feet. One minute. 8,810, technically, is the supposed answer they got. So I think there's overwhelming evidence there was a flood, and the Noah's Ark story is perfectly legitimate. And I think Noah had dinosaurs on there, and the, probably babies. I think Noah took babies of everything. Let's see. You said one zookeeper to take care, take, take care of 25 animals. Well, you're setting up a, a straw man and then knocking it down, thinking you've won some kind of victory. Suppose the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, all of the animals were vegetarian. Everything. And going changing from a vegetarian lion to a meat-eating lion is a pretty minor change compared to changing from a rock to a lion, which is what you guys in evolutionists believe. So I think after, during the flood, everything was vegetarian. I think everything, no would just, and none of the animals needed cages to put, give them a little room to sleep in, but leave the door open or don't even have a door, they, and just put out piles of food. They go buy their own food, go, go get their own food. So it's, it, you're, you're imagining a problem that does not exist. This way, Noah's family didn't probably have to do much of anything. If it needed, had a moon pool, if I was Noah, I would build it where such that every time you hit a wave, the water comes up and automatically fills all your watering troughs for you. 15 seconds. I think that'd be common sense to do something like that. So I think feeding and watering the animals took no time at all from Noah's family. I think you're um, claiming there wasn't a flood based on some uh, uh, fallacious arguments. Okay, go ahead. All right. I appreciate that opening statement. That concludes the opening statements from both Mark and Dr. Hoven, roughly uh, roughly 12 minutes. So thank you to the chat. We're close to 300 people in the chat. So I know there's a lot of questions flying in. Just make sure you are tagging me at Standing for Truth. So Mark, I'm going to hand it over to you. You have between six and eight minutes for your rebuttal. Of course, whatever you don't use, we can just toss into the discussion portion. You are on mute. Just make sure that you unmute yourself and we're good to go. Sure, no problem. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Ken, for your opening. I, I really did enjoy that. Um, so a few things I want to address. And, and first off is the cultures all around the world having various flood legends. Now, um, it's funny that you brought up the Yellow River because in that story, the entire world didn't flood. It was just the Yellow River and it wasn't just the um, uh, food Futu that, that survived, it was actually a whole bunch of stuff. The idea of that myth is that he controlled the flood, not that it actually went out of control. So you've got the wrong end of that myth there. Um, maybe getting your myths confused. Um, the, the, the fossil record doesn't support Kent's thing. And, and the, the whole thing about layers that he mentioned, like, oh, you have all these layers, is in some places we do find those layers flipped over. So it has the, the, the hard rock then up to the, the sedimentary and then reversed on top of it because of the way plate tectonics work. Now, sometimes it gets pushed up, abducts, and then flips over. And, and that doesn't explain why that happens if it is indeed a flood that did that. And that's why most geologists don't think that flood geology actually explains geology at all. Um, erosion doesn't need a flood. There's no case where we've ever you know, needed a flood to have erosion. It just it, it is a ludicrous claim. Um, now, this, this whole idea of that, that particular boat that was found, this is the Turkish government, and I'm very familiar with this one. There was a paper that did a chemical analysis, and I'll just find the doctor's name, uh, David Franklin Fasold. He did a chemical analysis on it and found that um, there was no petrified wood in this particular um, site for the, for the boat. It's actually just looks boat shaped and is purely natural rock. And I, I do have the paper where he did a chemical analysis on it. Um, the iron brackets that were found that were mentioned were actually limonite. So basically not iron, but a, uh, uh, a raw form that you find naturally in the earth. And the drogue stones were from that exact area. So they weren't transported from anywhere else. And we can tell this through chemical analysis. So in fact, those drogue stones were dug up or the stones were dug up from that area. So they didn't travel anywhere. They were just made there. Um, the crosses they determined were added later. They weren't, um, you know, put on there. They weren't carved on there when the stones were carved from the very rock at that site. 
So a chemical analysis shows that that isn't the arc because it isn't fossilized wood, it's just purely natural rock. Um, now, the, the whole thing about having babies on the arc, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of confounded because younger animals need more care than older animals. So that kind of reinforces my point. And it also adds the question of if there were babies, where did the milk come from? Like, this is the problem with mythology. You plug one hole with this this sort of statement and another hole opens up somewhere else. So the holes are getting more, not not less after that. So it, I'm kind of baffled. Um, it, it's funny that, that Ken accuses me of making a straw man, as he said, uh, uh, something about a dot smaller than a period, which I think, I think is the Big Bang he's referring to. I don't know why. It's not really a subject for this debate. Not only is that a straw man, it's also a red head. Herring. Um, for anyone unfamiliar, a red herring is something that you, you throw out to distract the audience away from, you know, what you don't want them to see. It's, it's a big distraction. And, and I, I don't know why why we're suddenly going into a, a, the, these fallacies of, of red herrings and straw men. Um, I didn't mention sales twisting planks. And I did, in fact, mention barges uh, that were of a similar size. And they're, they're planks twist as well. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the barge, Kent, but a barge doesn't have sails and these barges of similar size made of wood their planks still twist they do need bilge pumps as i did you know uh, uh, iterate before and and um they don't have sails so that's a moot point now a moon pool for i don't know how you would solve the structural problems of a boat by putting a hole in the bottom it, it, it's it, you already have a wooden boat with structural problems. Putting a hole in the bottom does not solve those structural problems. In fact, it makes it far, far worse. Most boats with moon pools are actually made of steel, not wood. Um, there's a, a boat would, of that size would not have a moon pool if it's made of wood. Steel, maybe, but but not wood. That's that's ridiculous. Um, a perfectly calm uh uh world while while you have a global flood hard to believe um uh, okay um now the the one thing that did stand out is the way ken said oh a lion wouldn't change much going from um a a, a vegetarian to a meat eater and that's incredible so a lion has a digestive tract tract that is is absolutely suited for digestion of meat and claws for grasping prey teeth that cannot cannot eat i think it was hay he said they ate um you would need a total rework of that creature in order to change it to a vegetarian creature and i mean what we're talking about here is not just a change in species or genus or family but a change in order from order um something like eat that eats hay like Bovin day, um, like cows, or equine day, which is horses, to order carnivora. So this is beyond the most ridiculous, optimistic dreams of a of a of a, a geneticist to see a a hay eating lion turn into a meat eating lion over the course of what less than a century, uh, less than a millennium. Uh, no, no, that is so ridiculous. I I, I don't even know where to start. Um, yeah, and that, that's sort of what I picked up from um, um, Kent's, Kent's opener. Um, and, and, you know, I'd, I'd like to iterate, what, what is gopher wood? What, what, what is that? Because uh, we don't seem to know. In fact, there's a whole load of stuff about the Bible we don't seem to know. But, um, yeah, that's the problems I had with the, the evidence that Kent presented. Okay. Well, I appreciate that rebuttal, uh, Mark, with a minute to spare. As always, we throw that into the discussion portion. So uh, that being said, we're going to hand it over to Kent. You have up to eight minutes as well. I'll start. All right. The first I, word. Thank you so much, sir. This is why I so much uh, prefer one topic at a time. What's happening here is Mark's throwing out eight or ten different topics, and I won't have time to answer each one adequately during my eight-minute rebuttal. And therefore, he will think, oh, wow. Uh, I won on point number four and three or six and seven. So one topic at a time, please. Okay. As far as bringing babies on the ark, where would they get the milk? Okay, Mark, let me explain. After babies get done with the milk stage, they enter a period we call adolescence for humans, and they're able to take care of themselves, 
and they don't need milk anymore, but they're still not full size. So let's just say Noah took adolescence on the ark, if that would help you, uh, to the point where they did not need milk anymore. They get to a certain stage. Okay. Big Bang, straw man, is not a straw man at all. You, you made the argument that all the animals could not fit on a boat that size. I'm pointing out that what you've given people in exchange for not believing that, the atheists and evolutionists that I'm aware of, all of them, 252 that I've debated so far, instead they believe everything, all the planets, the whole Pacific Ocean, everything fit in a dot smaller than a page, smaller than a period on a page. This is not a straw man. For you to claim Noah could not put all the animals on a boat and then turn around and believe that they all fit in a dot is real ridiculous, incredibly ridiculous. Okay, so uh, let's see. Fit in a dot. Okay. The hole in the bottom of the boat with the moon pool, uh, I, I think, is perfectly legitimate. You can build a wooden boat with a hole, a structure. I've built stuff all my life. It would not be difficult to take a wooden boat, have a hole in the bottom, and build walls up on the inside. They build tower things out of wood in round shapes all the time. It could be square. I don't know that it was round, but it could. Uh, Noah could have built a moon pool and reinforced it and easily uh, survive a one-year flood. Plus, you are oh, still stuck with the assumption it's rough. You said, well, during a global flood, it's going to be, you know, the ocean's going to be tumult tumultuous. I would be willing to bet you 20 bucks there are storms going on right now someplace on the planet. I bet there are hurricanes and typhoons going on someplace right now that is not affecting the beach in Alabama at all. It's perfectly calm here while it's stormy over here. I bet you get storms in Australia that we here in America don't know about and don't care about. So it is, it is ludicrous to say the whole world was tumultuous the whole time. It's a really, really big planet. And so it could have easily been calm seas where Noah was. All it has to do is the water come up, drown everybody, and go back down. It doesn't have to be tumult at all anywhere, for that matter. But the moon right now, the moon a quarter million miles away, is pulling a bump up on the Earth uh, called the high tide. It holds that tide like a magnet while we spin around. At my latitude, Lenox, Alabama, 31 degrees, we're going about almost 900 miles an hour toward the east at this latitude. So if the moon is holding a bump of water called the high tide, while we spin around, the water has to be constantly being dragged sideways to stay under that bump at the same speed the earth is turning. So if there were nothing to interrupt the tide, the tide would become harmonic and it would be a 200 foot tidal change every six hours, 12 and a half minutes. So <clears throat> the water going in sideways into fill that bump would be going the same speed the earth is turning. If the water were going sideways at 900 miles an hour, it would make a whole bunch of layers in a hurry. This is a demonstration we do here at Dinosaur Adventure Land uh, to show rapid sedimentation. And to say the layers are different ages is so ludicrous. Where are these layers coming from? Outer space. All the layers form quickly. I have demonstration out of, I'm part of our a part of our tour we give here, where we shake up a jar with sand, gravel, and clay and water in it, and it always sorts it out and settles it into a sand, gravel, or gravel, sand, clay. Things are it's hydrologic sorting. It's common sense 101, physics 101. Things are sorted by density uh, and by surface tension and by numerous other factors. So um, I think the, the flood of Noah would explain all the layers. It certainly would explain the polystrata fossils we find. Thousands of trees have been found petrified standing up, connecting all these layers. Um, the layers are all the same age within a few weeks of each other, just sort settling out in a flood. And then you've mentioned about the meat eating lion if, I need you to do some research on what happened in London during World War II. They told the London Zoo, sorry, no more meat. we got to give all the meat to the soldiers. So they fed the lions cabbage. They didn't like it at first, but they got used to it. And they lived just fine throughout the whole war on cabbage and other vegetable material for the lions. Yes, uh, uh, carnivorous animals can learn to live on vegetation. We know the lions did. Uh, what was the name of that one at the London Zoo? I cover this on my video number six, I think. Anyway, so I have to strongly disagree. This is not a problem. But again, going from a, everything was vegetarian. After the flood, we see in Genesis chapter nine, God told Noah, now the animals are going to be afraid of you. Before that, they weren't afraid. Everything was friendly. Noah didn't need cages on the ark. Let all the animals run around, play together. 
And then after the flood, when they let them all out, they spread out around the world. And some, beca some became carnivorous. Some animals today can live on either one, vegetation or meat. Bears can do that. They're omnivores. Humans are that. Omnivores can eat either one. There are some today that have adapted to a stri strictly meat environment. But this is 4,400 years after the flood was over. And I think so even the carnivores, I bet you could probably get most of them, if not all of them, to learn to live on vegetation again. I bet that could be, but again, going from a meat-eating lion to a vegetarian lion would still be a minor change compared to going from a rock to a lion, which is what the evolutionary theory teaches. So I think there's only two options. The Bible's true or it's not true. <clears throat> I've chosen to believe that the book is true. And so far, all the evidence I've seen from science says, man, that's true. The earth cannot be billions of years old for all kinds of scientific reasons. The earth is spinning, but it's turned, slowing down in its spin. The moon's getting further away. The oceans are getting saltier. The human population is rising. I cover on my video number one about 30 or 40 different ways to show it can't be billions of years old. And the, the Bible says at the end of time, the scoffers would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. The last days there shall be scoffers walking after their own lust. Let's see. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. There were three heavens and the earth was standing out of the water. The scoffers are ignorant of the creation. They're ignorant of the flood. Uh, let's see right here. Uh, let's see what the original creation was like. It was very different. I cover this in, and they're ignorant of that flood. That, and that I think is what the problem is here. Um, Mark, you don't, you don't want to admit there was a global flood. Of course, that would mean mm -hmm. God has the authority to judge his creation. And he did and he will again one day. <clears throat> You're gonna be there. I'm going to say, God, I tried to tell him. I don't know what else I can do. But, okay, go ahead. All right. I appreciate that. Thanks for your rebuttal, Kent. That concludes the opening statements and rebuttals. Epic debate so far, gentlemen. Great chat. Great questions coming in as well. Now we're moving into the open discussion portion of the debate. As always on this channel, we like to keep the discussion professional equally timed with the debaters discussing one topic at a time. We could always take turns asking each other questions, lots of uh, lots of points brought up in the uh, openings and rebuttal. So since uh, Kent just ended with his rebuttal, Mark, why don't we hand it over to you? You can start us off in this discussion, maybe at a question you wanted to ask or a couple points you wanted to address. So gentlemen, the floor is yours. Fantastic, thank you so much, Stan and Patrice, I appreciate it. Um, Ken, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that, you know, you're having trouble keeping up. Uh, you know, you said that eight to ten topics. I, I have the same problem. So I think, you know, things are fair and, you know, this is just the way a debate works. So I, I do apologise if I am running quickly. We can certainly go back and address any any topic that you do want to address. That's not a problem. Um, I note that you didn't sort of address my problem of the red herring of what I believe. Like what I believe doesn't make the uh, arc story any truer or falser. So I think that's just sort of a, a, a red herring thrown out there. Um, and, and, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Um, I, I would like to talk about the animals and what they ate. Um, I did a quick search. I couldn't find any history of a lion eating cabbages. I, I think that, you know, the, the, the article that I'm looking at said they had a lot of trouble getting food for the lions and other carnivores and you know of course the the eagles and 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 kestrels and things that i did mention um but it didn't say anything about lions eating cabbages so i don't know where you got that from can you google that right now oh is that you uh, yeah well yeah london zoo uh during world war ii there was a lion. Uh, there's a lion today. It's famous lion that is still alive that w refuses to eat meat. It only eats plants. I, I covered this on video number six of my series. I don't have it. I got like 12, 15,000 okay. slides. But yes, okay. now vegetarian lion. Just Google vegetarian Vegeta lion. Somebody help me out. Who's got a phone? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, did they still have the, the fangs and ripping? Oh, teeth yeah. Or? Yeah. Have you ever so seen the how... teeth? Of a, have you seen the teeth of a panda bear? Well, it, it's just more the physical act of chewing I hay the that panda, requires panda a really has large... big fangs, and it lives on bamboo. Panda bears got fangs. Well, a panda's bamboo. got sort of specialized molars for for chewing kind of thing, like most Why does animals it have the fangs? Chew hay. Why does it have the sharp panda bears have sharp teeth? Why? Uh, most defensive um, uh, specialization, as far as I'm aware, I'm not a biologist, but I believe it is a defensive specialization, like most bears um because okay, well, bears are omnivorous 
but um, really we're talking about lions and, and really I want to talk about kestrels as well, you know, the raptors, which are birds of prey, like how did they um, sort of eat hay with a beak? Well, I would say going from a vegetarian hawk or uh, eagle or one of these type of animals to a meat-eating hawk or uh, uh, bird of prey is still a very minor change compared to going from a rock to a hawk, which is what evolution teaches. That Why do you rock, rocks? The evolution theory says the earth cooled down 4.6 billion years ago, developed a hard rocky crust. It rained yeah. on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup and the soup came alive. And that first uh, ancestor, probably an amoeba of some kind, slowly became everything today. So yes, the evolution theory says we came from a rock, which is they're yeah, welcome I'm to believe. I not resent really here to, to have that talk time. about evolutionary theory. Like this is why okay, I yeah, said I wanted to. Ad- well, I wanted to address the sort of red herring of throwing out there. Oh, well, this is what you believe, or this is what evolutionists believe, kind of thing, okay, which it. is a red herring because it doesn't really factor into whether the Noah's Ark story is true or false. Um, it's just the unlikelihood of a hawk being vegetarian with a with a beak and having you know hooked claws. Um, suddenly, you know, over the course of less than a thousand years, turning into a meat eater, which I'm sure you'll realize that it requires a very, very, you know, a cow has four stomachs for a reason, so it can digest that plant matter, right. yes? Sure, right. yeah. So, well, I'm able to digest either one. I suspect you are too, plants. Or Here's the article. It's on creation.com. The, animal, the lion was named Little Tyke. A female African lion born and raised in America lived her entire lifetime nine years without ever eating meat. For owners, George and Margaret Westbow Westbo, were alarmed by scientists' report that carnivores cannot live without meat. They went to great lengths to try to co- coax their unusual pet to develop a taste for it. They advertised a cash reward for anyone who could devise a meat-containing formula that the lioness would like. Anyway, this lioness went for nine years, never ate meat ever. That is, of course, an obvious exception to the rule. The point would be that it can be done. But you're missing the much bigger point. Whether you have a meat-eating lion or plant-eating lion, this is a minor, it's still a lion. This is a minor change compared to what you'd like other people to believe instead. Go ahead. That lion also got um, one half a gallon of milk, two eggs for for the protein because it could not get the protein in any other way. So where did they get the milk and eggs from? Well, I think on Noah's Ark, the chickens yeah. will still be laying eggs. They don't seem to care what, you know, our chickens lay eggs all the time. Some, some chickens lay an egg every day. Many birds lay eggs, sometimes free, very frequently. We have 30 different varieties of chickens here. I think on Noah's Ark, they would certainly have eggs without a problem. Uh, and then they would have milk. And maybe animals were producing milk. I think during the year long, from the time they're in the Ark, they would be mating and having babies even. So um, I, I think, again, you're making a, a minor point uh, into... The topic is, is the flood story and Noah's Ark fact or faith a fiction? I think mm-hmm. it is reasonable. So far, you've given no scientific reason why it cannot be true. Well, there's there's holes in this story is what I'm pointing out. I mean, you've in another hole has just opened up because you've said, you know, eggs and milk, but you've also claimed that they were adolescent, so not adult. So they wouldn't be producing eggs and milk. So you, you, Here we go again. Milk. Okay, let me, let me yeah. go again. A few of them were babies, a few were adolescent, a few were full grown. They oh, so now they've the changed. Okay. You. <laughs> Come on. Well, it, it sounds like you're sort of trying to fit the age of these animals to the story and not going, well, here's the evidence we have of, of no, you no. know, the age. I'm trying to the... say the story says they lived on the boat for a year. 350 other cultures say, yes, there was a global flood and Noah saved on the boat with animals on the boat. And I'm, when you come up with an interesting question, like, could that happen? Well, that's a reasonable answer. I don't know. You don't know. But it's a reasonable answer that it could have all kinds of sizes and shapes of animals on there. I think okay. if I was Noah, I would bring juveniles, small ones. Why bring a big elephant? You bring babies or young ones, at least, for several reasons. They're smaller. They eat less. They poop less. After the flood's over, they're going to live longer to produce more babies. And that's why you're bringing them. So it would make sense to bring juveniles or young of, of every, every kind you can, but if you needed to bring some for milk production or for uh, uh, the egg production, no problem. We have egg production here. What do we get, 30 eggs a day here at Dinosaur Adventureland off of our stupid chickens? 
Um, well, I mean, the, yeah, uh, that would require an incredible amount of chickens. Um, uh, I'm not sure how feasible that would be, as well as, you know, the, the milk producing creatures, an incredible amount of them to feed all of the car you know, animals of carnivora there. Um, aside from sort of the, the ridiculousness of a hay eating uh, uh, eagle, um, um, another another question I had was about the koalas because I, I love koalas. Uh, everybody loves koalas, um, native to my home. So how did they get the eucalyptus leaves they had to eat? Well, I think you have a couple of false assumptions in your head to start this question. You're assuming that the world today that we see where eucalyptus only grows in a few places is the way it used to be before the flood. Secondly, you're assuming that the koalas, which are now very specialized in eating eucalyptus, have always been that way. You guys like to believe in evolution, that animals can adapt to their environment. I think the koalas have adapted to a eucalyptus uh, uh, diet, and they seem to like it, and they seem to thrive on it, and maybe their digestive system even requires it now. But th that's an adaptation to the environment. That's not evolution. It's still a koala. So you're assuming today's koalas in 2021 is what Noah took on the ark, and they had to have the certain eucalyptus tree, and you're assuming that eucalyptus tree only had, only grows in Australia, and it didn't grow anywhere else anywhere, anywhere before the flood came. I think they found eucalyptus fossils in other places around the world. If the pre-flood world was what the Bible says, mostly land, God says he formed it to be inhabited. Today, only 3% of the world is habitable. Most of it's underwater still. 70% of it is still underwater. A whole bunch of it's under ice caps or deserts or treeless tundra. So uh, if only 3% of the world is habitable today, I think it'd be ludicrous to take today's environment and try to project that onto what Noah had to, to tolerate and what Noah had to grow up with. He probably grew up in a world that was 80 or 90% land and trees and plants. and Probably everything was growing everywhere. Today, certain plants won't grow in certain regions. They're in the blade of grass at the North Pole. It's ice. Okay, probably wasn't that way before the flood. So you're projecting today's environment onto... Noah situation and the pre-flood world, and I think that's where your mistake comes in. No, I, I'm actually not. Um, eucalypts have only been discovered in two places, and I just double-checked it in Australia, and there has been ancient eucalypts discovered in South America, which, uh, you know, I'm sure you'll admit is quite a far fetch from the near Middle East. Um, if there was eucalypts all around the world, as, as, as you've sort of claimed here, it's strange that we don't find any evidence of fossilised eucalyptus. And containing eucalyptus oil, they'll be readily um, um, identifiable as, as uh, members of that, that genus. So um, it, it's very, very strange that these eucalyptus are growing all around the world, everywhere, you know, just, just filling the world, but they only are found um, sort of in Australia and um, South America. Ah, uh, you've muted, Ken. Ken, you're muted. As fossils. Oh, no, there you muted. Oh. You're no, good now, Ken. I? You're good. Okay. okay. You're good now. They've, they've only been found, to your knowledge, in those two places, and I don't think all fossils have been discovered, and I don't think anybody, who would care if they found a eucalyptus fossil in Lenox, Alabama? But again, you're assuming the koala bears had to have that plant. Maybe they could live on cabbage back then, and they've adapted from cabbage to eucalyptus. That'd be a minor change for a koala bear. Well, not okay. really. I mean, this is, this is what I said at the very beginning, Mark. You don't want that book to be true. You don't want that flood story to be true, and you will jump through all kinds of circus hoops to make it so you can justify not believing in it. Okay. That's your choice. Well, uh I don't think it's true. I think that you're sort of engaging in a bit of, you know, mind reading as to what I want and what, 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 you know, I don't think you know what I think and what I want. I don't think you're capable of mind reading, Ken. Um, so um, I, I don't believe it because there is no evidence for it. And, and, you know, the evidence that I'm given seems to have all these holes and these, these flaws in it. Um, that's based upon being reasonable and rational, not, not any kind of what I want. It'd be great if there was a God, but I just don't believe it. So, you know, I don't think you know what I think. Um, and, and the idea that they adapt to eucalyptus leaves, um, their, their digestion has to be so specialized. It, it's, it seems very, very strange. And okay, I think that evolving into a, a, a modern koala that can feed on eucalyptus leaves in such a short time sort of shows that the, the flood myth, you know, never happened because um, things don't evolve that fast. It's as simple as that. They don't. Okay. They well, just don't. we've left about 30 topics hanging here. As you mentioned, let's go back and plug a few holes. 
Would you agree? Would you agree that you were incorrect to say the heat would be a problem for Noah's flood because the rising water would compress the atmosphere? It would not compress the atmosphere. It would lift it out into more into space. Plus, the volume of the Earth is not changing. The, the surface, the water is coming from under the crust to the surface. The diameter of the Earth would remain exactly the same. It's like the water came up and went back down. If the water came up and went down, where did it go? It's all still here in the oceans. The volume of the Earth, the diameter, has not changed at all. Before the flood, during the flood, after the flood. When waves go up and down now, it does not compress the air and create heat problems in the air. So I, would you at least, just to get that one point off the table, would you say, wow, Kent, you're right, I'm sorry. Raise, it would not raise the atmosphere's temperature. Would you yeah, agree I'm going to have to go ahead and disagree with you there. If, if the entire world simultaneously rose up to above Everest or above the highest point on the planet, which is what you're saying, um, the force of gravity keeping that air down, it would, uh, over the 40 days that the story says it happened in, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it says 40 days it rained and the water levels rose, that would compress the atmosphere. And I think that's been very, very clearly demonstrated. Um, so I, I don't I don't actually think you're right on, on that one, I'm afraid. So I, no, I wouldn't say that I will concede in any way. Yeah. Uh, I suspected that, okay. No, the water did not go over Mount Everest. The Bible says at the end of the flood, the mountains arose, the valley sank down, the diameter of the earth remained the same. Water that used to be under the crust came to the top, the crust would sink in, the earth's under water. Certain parts of it then would lift up toward the end of the flood because the earth is certainly broken up like an eggshell. There are fault lines all over the place and plate tectonics certainly works. But if, if a, place, a piece of earth the size of Texas was covered a mile deep in water, and then it tilted slowly. This area would come up and become mountain ranges. And this area would go down and the water would run off and make an ocean over here. And you can study the globe, Mark, nearly all, maybe all, but certainly nearly all of the mountain ranges follow the coastlines. The Rocky Mountains follow the Pacific. The Andes Mountains in South America follow the South Pacific. The Appalachian Mountains follow the North Atlantic. I think the crust of the earth simply shifted and tilted and the water when it ran into the new holes that are being created to become oceans, and some places lifted up. Some place, if we filled this room three feet deep in water, lifted up that end of the building, the water would rush down here, and now it's going to be six feet deep down there, and this is going to be above sea level. It doesn't change the atmosphere. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't think I can explain it to you. Yeah, it's strange that you say that, that plate tectonics works, because plate tectonics, yeah. and I, I agree, plate tectonics does work and seems to be the absolutely best explanation for you know the, the formation of the the land masses but that completely disagrees with flood geology so um I, i'm not sure to what degree you think that flood uh, tectonics uh, works but um you know you, you you've basically acknowledged that that plate tectonics is does work and that is antithetical to your flood geology no 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 the, the continents, the crust of the earth is certainly broken up even today. I taught earth science for 15 years. There are fault lines all over the place and they are still moving some of them. Some are locked in, there are slip faults and strike faults and different kinds of fault lines. None of them are my fault, but the earth has lots of faults. And the earth is shifting around, there's no question. That does not prove it's been going on for millions of years. It could have started yesterday or could have started a thousand years ago. The earth ha does have plates and they are shifting. And right after the flood, I believe, the oceans were smaller because the ice caps were larger. If you enlarge the ice cap, there's plenty of evidence that there was ice all the way down to Kansas City, Missouri. If the ice caps are larger, that's going to trap enormous amount of water and make the oceans smaller. While the oceans were smaller, England would not be an island. England would be part of France. Pity the poor French, okay? so. Uh, and as the oceans, as the ice melts back, it's going to raise the ocean level. You can look at a map, Google Earth. You can see the bottom of the ocean around Ireland and England. It's only 50 to 100 feet deep in the English Channel. So between Alaska and Russia, it's only like 60 feet deep. If you lowered the oceans today, 60 feet or 100 feet, and they average 12,000 feet deep. Take 100 feet of water out of the oceans, way less than 1% of the uh, vertical distance and freeze it and stick it on the North and South Pole. 
you now have kind of all the continents are connected. So this is not going to change the atmospheric pressure. As ice melts back, it runs into the oceans. The, the level of the circumference of the Earth remains constant the entire time. And even if you did swell up the Earth, the atmosphere is lifted with it. It does not change the temperature. Anyway, get somebody over there to explain it to you. So, well, the I, reason I, why I don't believe that is because, um, you know, you're, you're talking about the, the mountains rising up after the flood. You're talking about mountains sort of darting up in, in, in you know, less than a thousand or a thousand plus years. Um, the rate at which plate tectonics moves, it, it's impossible for those mountains to just suddenly zip up like that, you know, on a geological scale. Um, I think that we wouldn't, we would see a much faster rate of plate shift if your, um, you know, rapidly jumping up mountains were actually true, and we just don't see that. We see a very, very, very slow progression of plate tectonics. So I think that you don't understand the, the theory of plate tectonics and how slow it actually is if you have these, uh, um, you know, flash mountains suddenly suddenly appearing after, after the flood. It just makes no sense to me at all. Well, at no time, you can go back and listen to the tape, Your Honor, at no time did I ever say the mountains just jumped up or flashed up. It might have been a slow, gradual process. To go from sea level up five miles, to if you're walking five miles an hour, it takes you one hour to go five miles. If the mountains are rising five miles an hour, in one hour, they're five miles high. This is not a problem. What if it took five days to get up five miles high? The tallest mountain, Mount Everest, it's only about five or six miles above sea level. That's not that much compared to the size of the 8,000 mile Earth. Now you're in metric kilometers, I know, but uh, the, eight, the diameter of the Earth remains constant. The volume of the Earth remains constant. Things just get shuffled around. It doesn't change air pressure. It doesn't change air temperature at all. It just reshuffles things. And as the water runs off, it makes canyons very rapidly, especially in areas where the dirt is still soft, mud layers, from Noah's flood, uh, Mobile Bay and Pensacola Bay, about seven feet deep. That's it. Between Australia, where you are, and Vietnam, the water's only about 30 or 40 feet deep. If you lowered the ocean, say 50 feet or 70 feet to be safe, the, everything's connected. You could walk to Australia. I think after the flood, the waters were, oceans were smaller, the ice caps were bigger, trapping all this water. And then it would take several hundred years to melt that ice back. During that several hundred year period, animals migrated away from the ark, and certain ones happened to end up in Australia. The koala, the wombat, the kangaroo, and, they, and they're less aggressive than other animals, okay? So I think from the Noah's Ark flood story, the animals would migrate out away from the ark and ended up in Australia at the same time. The, content, the water's rising, and now they're trapped and protected from their enemies. And they've developed all kinds of, I don't know how many kinds of kangaroos you have over there, 20 or 30, I guess. Uh, and th th and they're, they're safe from predators, generally. <clears throat> so I think the, the flood story, the, the, the title of the debate tonight was, is the flood story, is it, is it fact or fiction? I think it is, it, it, the flood story can explain everything we see on the geology of the Earth today and on the bio, bio, uh, biographical distribution of all the animals. Uh, okay, I think you, you jumped reasonable. over a few topics there, so I'll try and okay, go which back one? and address which them. One? Well, uh, I mean, you, you went into like, you know, the, the tallest mountain, five miles high and stuff. The mountains are high, way higher than five miles, and you basically said if it went one mile a, a, a day, it might have only taken five days. Um, geologic, you know, sort of events are calculated in, in centimetres or, or, or inches for, for those in the, uh, the uh, uh, states. Um, they're not mentioned in miles per, you know, the, the, the rates that you're giving are way exorbitant. And if they did move at that pace, we would definitely notice that that isn't even remotely realistic. Um, I find it hilarious that you've said the animals in Australia are less aggressive. Um, I don't know if you've ever come face to face, hello? Uh, face to face with a kangaroo, it's definitely more aggressive than you think. Um, they are notoriously aggressive, including stuff like emus, which are notoriously aggressive. Um, I know we lost a war against them. Um, yeah, so so the idea that animals in Australia are less aggressive is is I'm really sorry, it's just not accurate in the slightest. In oh. fact, the animals in Australia have a reputation for being very <clears throat> aggressive, and I can I okay, can attest to that myself. One topic at one topic at a time. 
We have well, three I mean, emus. You started the multiple topics. So. Okay. Well, we have three emus here at Dinosaur Adventureland. They are very friendly. You can go pet them, grab them, pull some feathers out, and give it to the kids who come visit. Uh, I think if you put your kangaroo in a cage with a lion, the kangaroo would lose. They, I agree. Kangaroos can be aggressive. I understand. I've been to Australia. We've petted them, and uh, they place you have places over there where you pet kangaroos. Okay, but in a, in a competition with a lion, they would lose. My point was. They're spreading out from Noah's Ark. They would tend to be less aggressive than the, like, say, the lions, for example. And they ended up trapped. I don't know. We'll have to watch a video when we get to heaven about how this happened after the flood. I'll try to get the message to you wherever you are at the time. But uh, the migration wave would be very simple away from the, the kangaroos may be aggressive compared to people. And they certainly are. Watch, watch Steve Irwin, you know, fight the kangaroos. But the Compared to other animals, they're not. So as far as emus and stuff, like I said, we have them here. They can be they can be tamed. And I think animals today are generally only aggressive because of competition for food or competition for resources. Getting on Noah's Ark, if they had everything there, plus if they're confined to a boat, they sleep a lot more. Animals that are confined sleep a lot more. People do too that are confined. So I, on the Ark, I don't think it would be a problem for these animals to get along. After the flood, they would take off and find their own niche. Those okay. that have longer hair would be more comfortable where it's cold and tend to migrate north. And you know, animals tend to find a place where they're comfortable. Or okay. nature will uh, 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 eliminate those that don't have the needed uh, traits to survive there. Short-haired okay. dogs, like you have the dingo in Australia, th they wouldn't survive on the North Pole. They wouldn't survive in Alaska. They don't have enough fur. Whereas the coyotes and the wolves survive just fine. And a wolf would probably not survive in the outback of Australia because they got too much hair. They, they hold their body heat too well and they would overheat. So nature does, you know, and the animals have adapted to their environment, but it's still the same kind of animal. In that case, it would still be the dog kind. Uh, okay. Well, I, I think they place. evolved to their animal, to their, to their environment, but you know, that would be a difference between you and I's perce perce perception. So if you think, say they adapt, okay. Um, if you, if you will indulge me, I just have have a couple other questions. And while we're on animals, um, so the insects on the ark, and I mentioned this in my opening with the bees, and what would how would the bees get pollen and nectar kind of thing? So do you have any answer for that? I guess so your Australian accent is messing me up. I don't understand your question. The insects uh, on the, the ark did what? The bees, for instance, um, or, you know, the bees or... The right, gathering right. creatures. Well, again, they, they have need a, pollen and nectar. Yeah, I think you have a, a false assumption that Noah had to have insects on the ark at all. Insects can survive a flood just fine. If Noah was in the ark for a year, that does not mean the whole world is flooded for a year. Certain parts of it might have only been flooded for a couple of weeks. All it would take just to kill the people, kill the, the but primarily to kill the people, but kill the animals too. So insects can survive on floating log mats. I mean, we see this in Mount St. Helens. There was a log mat that was several square miles, I believe, that's still floating today, 40 years later. There's, a, there's a, its own little biosphere. Thousands and thousands of logs that got blown in from Mount St. Helens, they're still floating there. The wind blows the whole log mat back and forth. So this floating log mat is its own little bio. In, insects survive fine. All okay. types of insects. So if, okay, I don't, so I don't think there were flowers and there. stuff on the, the log mat. There were flowers on there and everything, so the bees could collect nectar oh, and pollen. Flowers can, flowers can bloom on floating okay. log mats. It happens all the time. Ask anybody who studies oceanography. There are giant mats of vegetation floating around in the ocean today with flowers all over them. So there were no insects on the ark? I didn't say that. I said he wasn't required to. God told Noah to bring onto the ark all those on land which means don't bring the fish, in whose nostrils is the breath of life. Insects don't have nostrils. They breathe through spiracles in their skin. So I don't believe Noah was required to bring insects. Some insects might have been on there, but he wasn't required to bring them, and they could have survived outside the ark on floating log mats, or if, again, if the crust of the earth is flexing up and down. By the way, an earthquake can do rapid movement to the crust of the earth. Ask the folks in Japan here recently. So uh, the crust of the earth can flex very rapidly, or it can flex very slowly or slowly twist and move and distort continents and distort things. It, it, it's all kinds of variables in there. So my take would be he wasn't required to have insects. They can survive on a, a floating log mats. Or certain parts of the land might have been only underwater for a few weeks. And they would simply move to places. 
if a place is inundated for a few days, that's enough to kill all the animals. But I don't think it's it'd be enough, enough to kill the plants as well. Can fly away. What now? Well, it's enough to kill the plants as well. And I, I mean, I'd, I'd hear you say that flowers would be on a floating log mat, but I, I, I have trouble believing that a hive of bees would survive on a floating log mat with very, very limited resources for okay. any amount of time. I, I have a lot of trouble believing that. It just seems like right. that's a I, part I of, have a lot of You have a lot of trouble believing the whole flood story. I have a lot of trouble believing yeah. the alternative you guys offer of evolution. I, I have a real hard time believing sure. we came from a rock. Well, let me jump well, in here real quick. Not really, what the belief is sure. And and this has been a great, fantastic debate. I've got a few minutes left on the clock for the discussion. I'm, I guess, since Mark just asked a couple questions there, for the last couple minutes, Kent, maybe there's a couple questions you wanted to ask Mark. Sure. As we kind of wind things down, and uh, it's it's been very civil and cordial, gentlemen. Great discussion. So go ahead, Ken. If there's a question you you may have wanted to ask, uh, no, let's let's go into question and answer from the audience here. It's already been an hour and a half, and I'm sorry for okay. our technical problems at the beginning, but go ahead. No worries. Oh, time flies. I didn't even know. Wow. That's <laughs> time flies by. So I just wanted to make sure that you both felt uh, you were able to ask the questions you wanted to and, and that it was uh, evenly timed. What we'll do, because we have a five minute concluding statement before some of these questions, just to wrap things up. Why don't we, uh, Mark, you, you started, you don't got to take the whole five minutes, but let's at least kind of wrap up our thoughts and points. Mark, take up to five minutes. We'll allow Kent to do the same thing and then we'll get to some of these questions. Yeah. Okay. So uh, from from my position, I, I, I haven't really um, gotten um, answers that I think are credible um, from Ken. Uh, I, I do acknowledge he's tried, and you know, obviously, he comes from from a belief system that that sort of, uh, to my mind, must believe that uh, this is true. So um, what we have here is sort of vegetarian eagles and vegetarian lions and. Uh, um, um, a koala bears that suddenly evolved to eating eucalyptus leaves within you know a couple of hundred years um it's all outside the realm of of, of believability it's not credible to me um and and this is the reason why most christians don't believe that believe that the, the flood story the the flood myth it, it, it's hyperbole it, it's sort of trying to teach a lesson and in their defense to to the christians um there, there is still room for a god in that in that story that it is hyperbole and and um, you know sort of a a a story to teach you something. Um, um, otherwise, the the um, the the sort of I'm, I'm trying to be charitable. The the very far fetched things that you would have to believe sort of mount up and up and up. Um, you know that 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 you've got a a wooden boat with a hole in the bottom is is your your best way of surviving there. or um you know these vegetarian carnivores um that that the lion suddenly you know went from a hay eating four chambered stomach of some sort and evolved quickly into order carnivora um within a few thousand years as i said it would the most optimistic evolutionary biologist wouldn't wouldn't believe that because of the rapidity of it um, it, it just is so far-fetched and, and ridiculous that, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I can possibly entertain um, that that all of this happened um, over such short a, a time frame. And um, but at least at least Kent and I do agree that the plate tectonics does work. I think that I would agree with the geologists that sort of say plate tectonics does take millions of years, and less against you know these. Um, these plates whizzing around in a, you know, geologically speaking, whizzing around in a couple of hundred years. I, uh, I think, I think uh, that seems to be uh, very unbelievable. Um, what's still more believable to me is that it was perhaps a local flood with a smaller amount of things, um, and um, you know, that 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 was exaggerated over the retelling and retelling of a story by the time it was written down like all good stories and tall tales do it has been aggrandized into what we currently see as the flood myth thank you okay i appreciate that concluding statement mark hour and a half really has flown by we've had a great chat over 300 people lots of great questions for a q a so we're going to hand it over to uh kent you also have up to five minutes for a concluding statement go ahead all right i do very strongly believe the bible is literally true god created everything in six days i don't think there's any way for the symbiotic relationships we see in nature to 
is slowly evolve. I mean, certain animals require certain plants, a koala, et cetera. And I think everything was designed at the beginning. And I think the Bible said there would be scoffers who would scoff at the creation and they would scoff at the flood. They're willingly ignorant of the creation and of the flood. Second Peter three talks about that. So I think if the topic of the debate was, uh, let's see, I get the name of it right. Noah's Ark and the flood, is it fact or fiction? I've defended the position that I think all the facts, there's nothing scientifically uh, where it can be demonstrated that it's not factual. And why would, why would God tell Noah to build a boat? And why would all these countries have a legend about a flood? Now, it may be that the particular Chinese legend that he mentioned was about a local flood. Well, that doesn't mean all the rest of them are. <laughs> there are local floods all the time. And I don't think it's lo logical for God to tell Noah to build a boat to get away from a local flood especially a boat 500 feet long. He could tell him, Noah, move. I mean, how far could you move in 100 years? So, And to fill it with animals and all this kind of stuff. So I think that uh, the, the Bible said the scoffers would be ignorant of the f uh, creation and the flood and the coming judgment of God. And that's my biggest concern for people like Mark. Are you prepared? You're going to die one day. I hope you live a long time. But when you die, then what happens? You know, we're, if, my, if I'm right and you're wrong, this is Pascal's wager, you're in serious trouble. If you're right and the story's not true and the Bible's not true, I haven't lost anything. I've lived a wonderful life. I've enjoyed life just living for God, trying to live for what, the, what this book says. So I think I win either way. I think you got a big chance of it being a surprise, your judgment day. Anyway, we do a lot of videos and stuff on this topic. You get my stuff on uh, 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 creation and the flood from drdino.com, D-R-D-I-N-O. Okay, go ahead. All right. I appreciate that concluding statement, Dr. Hoven. Uh, fantastic debate, guys. It's been a ton of fun. Great discussion. Very cordial, professional, and tons of great questions and topics discussed. So this was a lot of fun. Uh, that being said, I want to give a disclaimer to the audience. I've got, I'm going to put 20 minutes on the timer or else we will be here all night and probably all day tomorrow. We've got a ton of questions. So I want to apologize ahead of time. If I don't get to your super chat, I want to thank you for the super chat, for the support. If I don't get to the question, I want to apologize ahead of time. So we will get to as many as we can. Now, as we do here, a gentleman, uh, Kent Mark, uh, whoever the question is for, they get the uh, response, of course, they get to answer it. Then we'll give, let's say the question's for Mark, we'll allow Kent to have a response. Whoever the question was for always gets the last word though, and, and that'll allow us to move smoothly along. So here we go. We'll start with this super chat that came in. I appreciate it. From one God is now here one. I appreciate the support. So this one's for you, Mark. So he asks, how did the whale fossils found buried in the upper Andes mountains get there? And how was the scientific method used to determine this? Um, well, I'm not a geologist, but I believe it was due to uh, the shifting of plate tectonics that basically the um, that section of mountains at one point was underwater and the plates do move around. So it wasn't always uh, mountains at one point it was uh, under the ocean um, and i believe that they the scientific method they do uh, uh, to to tell this is uh, chemical analysis and um, analysis of other um, um, areas kind of thing um, but as i said i'm not a geologist but i believe that's how they um, you know uh, uh, have developed the theory of plate tectonics Okay, I appreciate that answer, Mark, to a good question. I think thanks for the super chat, Kent. If you had a response, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. The fact that we have fossils at all is indication of rapid burial in a flood. How many animals died today around the world? Billions. How many are going to turn to fossils? None. Fossils simply don't form, certainly in any quantity today. Yet we find fossils by the trillions. There are fossil beds in Wyoming and uh, Canada and places like that where there are unbelievable numbers of fossils, all tangled up, obviously buried in water, drowned. I mean, I don't think anybody argues with that. Uh, the Terrell Museum up there in Canada has a huge area over a, uh, nearly a square mile, uh, over a, one square mile of just all fossil bones that all packed together from a flood to get a, and to, for a whale to drown, think about it, whales live in the water. For a whale to drown, there would have to be a rapid temperature change in the water 
or uh, problems like the rapid movement of the water, tidal waves and kind of things like that. But if, if the flood story is correct, the fountains of the deep broke open, according to the Bible. The water under the crust came to the surface. Hot water from in the earth would have come up and would have killed things in the oceans too. There are billions of fish fossils found, and then they, all the fossils would be sorted based upon numerous factors, based upon their habitat, you know, where they live. Birds are generally found at the top because birds are the last ones to drown in a flood. They run around to fly around till they run out of gas. They're based upon their intelligence, sorted based upon their mobility or their body density. Clams are generally found at the bottom because clams are heavier shells and they already live at the bottom. Here's a petrified clam in the closed position. We have thousands of them here. Billions have been found around the world. To get a petrified closed clam, it had to be buried alive. The flood is, I think, the only explanation for how you get millions and millions of petrified closed clams. Water coming up, rushing in from the side, make a layer of mud 50 feet thick in 10 seconds during Noah's flood. So fossils are great evidence for the flood story. Okay, well, thanks for that uh, response. Kent, Mark, the question was yours, so to be fair, go ahead, you can have the last word. Yeah, so the idea that fossils don't form, obviously they do, I think that, that Ken is sort of doing a bit of hyperbole there, but yes, they are rarely formed. Like we know that from the uh, uh, biomass that has existed in the world throughout the uh, uh, millennia, um, it's very, very rare for fossils to form. However, they don't just form in water. There's famously the tar pits in, I believe, California um, that do have a number of very, very uh, famous fossils in them. And, and that's not water. That was due to them falling into tar. So it's not only water that causes fossils, but the the the, uh, the uh, uh, environment has to be exactly right for fossils to form. And we've got billions of fish fossils where there's a ton of fish. So the chances of having more fish is more likely because there are more fish to begin with. Um, fossils are also found out of order from Kent's diagram. You do find clam fossils up towards the top and out of order of what his thing says. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not just that, that fossils only form in water, they can form under a number of conditions. Um, just, yeah, fossils are rare to find. That, that, that is definitely true. Okay, well, I appreciate that response. We're going to go right to this next question. This one's for you, Dr. Hoven, and it's related to uh, this last question and some of the points you and Mark brought up. So this is a question that came in a while ago from XDMan06. I appreciate it. So he says, can you ask Kent how aquatic life would be affected by a global flood? Well, as I mentioned, the Bible teaches that the fountains of the deep broke open. You can read the story in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. If the Bible story is uh, correct, when God first made the earth, there was water under the crust of the earth. There still is today a lot of water in the crust of the earth. That's why we have hot thermal vents. You go to the bottom of the ocean, they find tens of millions of hot water squirting up vents, squirting up into the bottom of the ocean. Well, if water squirting up into the bottom of the ocean, where is it coming from? Uh, deeper than that. There are still huge pockets of water trapped under the crust, in the crust of the earth, below the bottom of the ocean. And they are, we're just Google thermal vents. So I think before the flood came, there was an enormous amount of water stored in the crust of the earth. Most of that today is on the surface, which is why the earth today is 70% underwater when God created it to be inhabited. So something changed. So the hot water coming from inside the earth when the fountains of the deep broke open would kill the fish, would kill anything swimming in the water rapidly just from the thermal shock. I mean, temperature goes from, say, 70 degrees to 150 degrees in Fahrenheit. In a few seconds, everything's going to die in, in the water within a certain effective radius. And most of this seems to be along the fault lines. When the earth cracked up, the water would squirt out in hot water. It would kill everything within 10 miles and maybe most things within 20 miles and a few things within 50 miles. But the temperature is going to dissipate as it spreads out. It's going to be uh, absorbed by the rest of the ocean. So I think, again, the flood story would offer a reasonable explanation for why we find fossils at all, and certainly why we find billions and billions of fish fossils. Fish fossils are not rare. They're one of the most common. So I think there was a temperature change, rapid temperature change in the ocean. Well, thank you for that answer, Kent. Uh, Mark, if you'd like to respond to anything, go ahead. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, um, you know, where these, these thermal vents and how they would spew such an amount of water through, but, you know, uh, sure. Um, now, the, the aquatic life, how would it be affected? Well, I mean, I had no idea that it was supposed to be fresh water coming up here, which would rapidly kill all the sea life if you take a, a saltwater fish and put it rapidly into a fresh water, it will die. Um, so I, I think that that's even more implausible. Um, and, uh, you know, this whole idea of thermal shock, uh, it, it seems very, very strange that at one point, you know, Kent's saying, well, it wouldn't affect the, the atmosphere thermally, and perhaps that's not what he's referring to. Um, and suddenly it, it has thermal shock from thermal vents um, creating fish fossils. Um, I, I think that, that if the thermal, that, that if water did come, fresh water did come into the salt water, you'd have a, a myriad of problems. I mean, all the fish would die, not just a, a great deal or many of them and have fish fossils. It, it, everything would die, um, as well as, you know, the problems with turning off the uh, the currents throughout the uh, the ocean. Um, yeah, to me, to me, that seems less credible that it is fresh water than it is um, salt water. All right. Well, thanks for that response, Mark. Uh, the question was for you, Dr. Hoven. So to be fair, you get the last word. Go ahead. Well, again, he's, he's got some false assumptions. He's assuming the ocean was salt water. I think everything was fresh water, some of it hot, some of it cold. The oceans are getting saltier today. They, thermal, mineral salts wash off every time it rains into the oceans, and the oceans are gaining salt every day. Evaporation takes out just the water distillation process, the water, the clouds float over the land, rains again. There's a giant cycle going on that is constantly adding salt to the ocean. That puts a time limit on how old the oceans are. During the flood, I think everything was fresh water and Noah didn't have to bring water on the ark. Just get it right out, drop the buckets overboard or have a moon pool to fill your troughs. But so, yeah, I, and the, the idea of a thermal vent raising the temperature of the atmosphere, uh, I, I think is, you need to do some physics lessons on that. The, if a volcano blows up now, does it raise the temperature worldwide, or is it is it dissipated into you know it, it's a big planet? Volcanoes are going off right now, several places around the world, and it raises the temperature within an effective you know ten or twenty miles, but then it's quickly uh, diluted with all the rest of the air. The air's you know the world's awfully big, so I don't think there's any problem for the flood story with that analogy. Go ahead. Okay, I appreciate that, Ken. So next question, to be fair, we'll get one for you now, Mark. This one comes in all the way near the beginning from Redefine Living. So he says, question for, actually, question for both. So we'll get you both involved here. Uh, how would you explain a polystrate fossil from your model? Uh, did you want to go first, Ken, or do you want me to? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, um, so I believe with polystrate, and again, I'll iterate again, I'm not a geologist, but a polystrate fossil is one that basically um, goes through multiple um, layers kind of thing. Um, and this is usually when, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a tree basically is, uh, dies and then the, the uh, um, different um, rock is built up on top of it. So it can go through multiple layers. Um, uh, as, as it compresses and, and, and more and more sediment and other, other material is piled on top of it, it compresses down um, um, the tree, but it still does, um, it still does have, um, goes through multiple layers from, from where it is. Um, there's nothing unusual in geology as far as I'm aware of, of that occurring. Okay, I appreciate that response, Mark uh, and Kent. Go ahead. Well, uh, Mount St. Helens blew thousands of trees into Spirit Lake. My sister lived up near there when it happened, and I've been up there several times and st studied this. Thousands of those trees are still floating today, 40 years later, and many hundreds of them are floating in the upright position because the root end is heavier and, it's in, and they're going to slowly settle out and sink in the bottom. There are already hundreds and hundreds of trees stuck in the mud at the bottom of Spirit Lake. New layers of sediment are accumulating all the time. Every time there's a storm, it washes mud in off the mountains around there. And petrif petrified trees that are found standing up, called a polystrata fossil, as the, as the questioner mentioned, 
are quite, 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 quite common. Sometimes they're upside down. Now you got a real problem. If the tree is upside down, petrified, running through many layers, the layers are not different ages. There's some in, in France, the British Isles, they have those in Germany, Nova Scotia, Canada, there's from Nova Scotia right there. Uh, these are in uh, France. Petrified trees standing up, here's me by one in Yellowstone National Park, are, are pretty common. Polystrata fossils are indication of rapid burial. There they are, Mount St. Helens. Uh, no, oh, back here. So, uh, I think it was it happened during the flood of Noah. All of the layers would have formed in a matter of a few months during the flood. Just the moon pulling the tide up and down. If the tide's going up and down, it's rushing in and out also. This is going to be a rapid uh, stratification uh, process. So all the layers would have been formed in one year. And petrified trees that are standing up, connecting all those layers, is an indication the layers are not different ages maybe by a few weeks, but not certainly millions of years like they teach. So it fits my model fine. Okay, I appreciate it. That was a question for both. You both got an answer. So let's go to um, this next question. Mark, I want to thank you for being a good sport because most of these are for you. So <laughs> this next one. Uh, yeah, no worries, no worries. I appreciate it. You're in the lion's den. You're doing a good job. So this one comes in from... Uh, let me see here. Um, creation creatures. So he asked, this one came in a few times, actually. I've got a few different questions here on the Grand Canyon. So this is kind of going to get through many in one. So he asks, Mark, how did the Grand Canyon get carved up if there wasn't a global flood? River. There you go. The nice river. One. Yeah, it just, just goes through, erodes, 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 and it cuts down through the rock um, enough time, and that river will cut a canyon in, in the landscape. And, and before I hand it to Kent for a response, before I forget, because the chat's flying, we've got two after shows. So there's one on Logical Plausible Probables channel. Uh, thank you for the super chat. He says he's coming out of retirement. His after show kicks off five minutes after this debate. And uh, also Amy Newman also has an after show. If Amy wants to um, put the link or anything in the chat, I can put that up on screen as well. So we got two epic after shows after this epic debate. So that being said, uh, Kent, Go ahead if you wanted a response as well to the Grand Canyon question. Yeah, Grand Canyon was not formed by the Colorado River. That's ludicrous. The top of the canyon is 7,000 or 8,000 feet above sea level. The river enters the canyon at less than 3,000 feet, 2,800 to be exact. If you plugged up Grand Canyon today, a great big lake would fill up going back to uh, Colorado and to New Mexico or to uh, Arizona. So, I mean, New Mexico. I think any this in Bruton, Alabama, south of me, 20 miles, this farmer's lake got too full. And anytime any lake gets too full, it finds the lowest point, cuts a notch, and drains all the water out. Tom Sauk Reservoir got overfilled back in 2005. It carved out a notch, one side of the dam, drained the whole thing in 10 minutes. Just Google Tom Sauk Reservoir. This happens all the time. Canyon formation is not mysterious. They know how it happened. But to say Grand Canyon formed by that river is, is simply not possible. The bottom of the, that little river did not make that canyon. I'll show you the schematic of it here. I've got pictures in my video number six. Uh, oh, I guess it's not a different, different presentation. So the top of the canyon is 7,000 foot elevation. The river enters the canyon at less than 3,000 feet. Exits a canyon at 1,800 feet. River flow downhill. All rivers flow downhill. Grand Canyon is a washed out dam, a really big one. Probably formed in less than a week, not millions of years. That little river at the bottom of the canyon did not make that canyon. It flows through the crack. And sometimes the river dries up, but it didn't make that canyon. Mount St. Helens, same thing. Giant canyon formed there. Today, there's a little creek running through the bottom of that giant canyon. The canyon formed in hours. The creek's been flowing through it for 40 years. It has nothing to do with the canyon. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, Kent, for that answer. Uh, Mark, the question was originally for you. To be fair, if you want, you can have the last word. Yeah, you. sure. So, um, yeah, Kent sort of disagrees with with current geological thought, um, and uh, he, you know, his is the idea that the river. Um, it wasn't the river by itself. How did it form was the river. It cuts a channel, but it's also a number of forces acting upon it, like erosion and wind and just uh, just a whole bunch of forces over an incredible amount of time. 
Um, so I don't know where this this sort of belief that the the river cannot carve a channel um, comes from. Um, it, it the, the river carving a channel absolutely fits with with current geological models. So I I have no idea where where Kent's getting this this from. It's uh, baffling to me. Um, and uh, you know, geologic consensus would definitely agree with me on this. So uh, you know, feel free to Google it. Um, you know, I'm sure it. You know, the internet can provide more information than I can. Okay, well, I'm gonna. I want to at least get through these super chats. So I got another super chat from here. Thanks again uh, to Mark and, and Kent for the responses there on that question. So this one comes in from One God is now here. Ten dollars super chat. I appreciate it. So he says, I think this is more so directed at you, Mark. So we'll have you respond first. He says, testable prediction: small local floods do not leave behind graveyards full of thousands of drowned animals. Um, well, if he's talking about the fossil record, it's kind of hard to tell why animals have died. I mean, you had the whale example earlier, and I would have loved to get to this, so I'll mention it now. Um, you know, do we know that the whale drowned? No, we don't. We have no idea that the whale drowned or any of these other fossils drowned. We, you're just basically assuming that they did drown because you believe that a flood did happen. Um, they may have died from natural causes. They may have died from some cataclysmic event. Um, they may have died from um, predation and left a fossil as the bones were left. It's the conditions that make the fossil, not how they died. Um, so that sort of is based upon a faulty assumption just straight off the bat. Okay, I appreciate that response, Mark. And uh, Kat, if you had a response, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was distracted. Ask the question one more time. Sure, yeah, the question was, um, oh, here it is. Testable predictions. Small local floods do not leave behind graveyards full of thousands of drowned animals. Correct. Most animals can sense a flood coming and flee from it. I think you'll find, as I mentioned earlier, fossilization in general is a very rare process and there are trillions of fossils in the ground. It's not like fossils are hard to find. It's like they're hard to interpret for the evolution story because these simple fossils simply don't form in any significant numbers today, especially giant tangled up messes of fossils all tangled together. This was a global flood that destroyed the world. I finally found my slides on Grand Canyon, if that matters. Uh, I got about 50,000 slides here, Grand Canyon. Anyway, here's the schematic. I at least want to show you this so your visitors. The top of the canyon is 6,900 to 8,500 feet high. The river enters the canyon at 2,800 foot elevation and flows downhill. The top is higher than where the river, top, the river only goes through the bottom. That river did not make that canyon. The river flows through the canyon. If you plugged up Grand Canyon today, there would be a giant lake behind it that will go back to Colorado, back to New Mexico. There's what it would look like. Monument Valley there. Oh, there you go. So Grand Lake would form if you plug the canyon today. If you plug it up, take a lot of dirt, but you would form Grand Lake again. It got too full, went over the top, and probably washed out Grand Canyon in a matter of a few days, a week maybe, not millions of years. But so, yeah, fossils are not, are not forming in any significant number today. I think the flood's the only explanation for the giant fossil graveyards. Okay, I appreciate that response. And Mark? The question was originally directed at you, to be fair. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, that kind of went a, a tiny bit sideways. Um, so the fossils sort of, you know, saying the fossils are, are, are antithetical to, to evolution. Fossils are integral to the to evolutionary theory. Um, they're, they're used in, in many ways to show you, you know, the, the transition of form. So I don't know where Kent is getting that from. Um, so... When you say they sense all sense of flood and flee from, well, we know animals do die in floods. I mean, you know, there's there's multiple times where farmers have lost their stock to, to floods um, um, coming through, even local floods. And, and you know, again, I want to reiterate that you're saying, oh, well, on that scale of that we see, you know, millions of fossils, well, yeah, but you've got no evidence that they actually died from a flood. That's That's the whole point. Um, and I think I think maybe Kent missed that. Now, with with his slides and stuff, he even acknowledges that the Grand Canyon, as his slide says, is a washed out dam, i.e., that water cut that path down. 
Um, the only difference between what we're claiming is that I claim that it happened over millions and millions of years, and Kent claims that it happened in you know a, a brief time, um, which you know the Grand Canyon is is on that scale. I, I don't think that that's realistic in the slightest. Okay, Thank well, you. I, I appreciate that. That was your question mark. So to be fair, uh, we're going to give you the last word. So uh, we're going to we're coming up at the two hour mark. So we're going to wind it down with this last uh, last question here. Again, this one's for um, for you, Mark. Actually, I've got one one last question for you. One last for for Kent, and then we're going to call okay. it tonight. To be fair, so this one is from Anthony seventeen oh one. So I appreciate it, Anthony. Question for Mark. You said there is no evidence for the flood. By evidence, do you mean you and others have to agree with what is given as evidence for the flood for it to be good evidence? Well, I think that, the, I mean, good evidence is a whole nother debate, which I've done before and I'm, I'm happy to do. Um, but really we want to see um, evidence is usually indicative of one answer. It leads towards one direction and, and good evidence or evidences always um, co-support one another. So all of these things support one another's uh, story, basically. Um, so with the flood myth, there's that many um, problems with it that it fails to support one another. You've got that many holes in it. And, and good evidence doesn't have these holes. It doesn't have these trying to fit a, a round peg in a square hole of, oh, but you know, this explanation, which then adds another question, and then this explanation, well, it adds another question. What this usually is indicative of is having the conclusion up front, i.e. believing it happened up front, and then moving to find things to plug up what you think already happened, rather than examining the evidence and letting that lead you to a conclusion. Um, uh, I don't want to be rude to Kent, but I think that his approach is conclusion first, evidence later. And I think that that's very evident in, in the discussion that we've had. Okay, thank you for that answer, Mark. Uh, we'll throw it over to you, to uh, Dr. Oven, if there's anything you wanted to add. Well, I would say Mark is doing exactly what he's accusing me of. He's already come to the conclusion the flood didn't happen. The Earth is billions of years old, and he's looking at all. The, he's trying to force all the evidence, the, the square peg, into the round hole. It's him doing exactly what he's accusing me of here. Fossils don't form at all in any significant numbers without rapid burial. Fossils do not uh, indicate anything for evolution. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you really could prove is it died. You could not prove it's transitional between anything else. You could not prove it had any children at all, for that matter. You certainly couldn't prove it had children that lived. So the idea that fossils are transitional is ludicrous. Fossils are indication of death and rapid burial, because animals die today and they don't fossilize. The coyotes and the buzzards scatter them all over the woods. Uh, there are sedimentary rock layers found worldwide. I think there was a flood. There are fossils found worldwide. And I don't take the conclusion and may try to force the evidence into my conclusion. I think, Mark, here's exactly what you're doing. I, I can look at all the evidence and say, wow, this looks like these animals died quickly. I bet they drown. And there's a lot of them when there's 800 million animals in the Karoo Formation. 800 million in one big graveyard? I think that would take a flood to do something like that. So I think the Bible clearly says there was a flood. Jesus believed in a flood. Isaiah believed in the flood. The prophets, many of them talked about a flood in the days of Noah. So Mark's position, uh, I'm, well, I'm sure he understands this and probably doesn't, doesn't bother him, but his position clearly is saying the Bible is wrong. Jesus was wrong. Uh, the 350 flood uh, legends around the world, they're all wrong. He's right. So sad. Go ahead. Well, thanks for that answer, Kent. Now, Mark, um, we do have one last question that I missed. It's actually a super chat. It has to do with the flood again. So I know you probably want to respond to something that Kent said there. Yeah. Do you want to have to. a quick response? And then I'll throw this last yeah, question I'll, at you. I'll, I'll have a quick response. And uh, just to say that I'm not forcing evidence in, in one direction. There's been a number of these myths throughout antiquity, um, part of religious background, part of mythological background, like, you know, the Her 12 tasks of Hercules and all of these stories and uh, uh, Muhammad splitting the moon and things like that we see whether the evidence does back it up we don't force a conclusion that it didn't but but there's no reason to believe that it actually happened um now for fossils and evolution it really fossils are part of evolutionary study um that's very very noted there's predictive powers that we have like we found the fossil of um uh, 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 
pig turrets. I think I've said that wrong, but it was basically they predicted a bird with teeth. They did find a fossil of a bird with teeth. Um, and, and so it, 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 fossils are integral to the evolutionary theory, regardless of what, what Kent's claiming right now. And the whole idea that I'm right, um, no, I don't think so. I'm just more relying on the uh, studies of experts and people with a lot more knowledge in the field that I am and merely presenting um, their conclusions as my evidence today. So it's not just that I'm right is, is I think a bit misleading. So go ahead, standing for truth. Oh, no problem. It was your question. So you get the last word. I appreciate that. So we're going to make this the last question. It is a super chat. Again, I want to apologize to anybody in the chat whose question we did not get to. We are already going over on the Q&A. Uh, we're at about 25 to 30 minute mark. So that being said, this is the last question comes in the form of a super chat. It's for you, Mark. Uh, from one God is now here again, $10 super chat. I appreciate the support. He says, the average seven foot thick layer of limestone loaded with nautiloids in the Grand Canyon is another proof that Little River didn't carve the canyon. So go ahead. That would, would Yeah. So, yeah, well, limestone is, you know, I mean, it is a um, pretty thick rock. I don't think it is um, at all um, uh, uh, implausible to think that, that water over a long period of time could not carve through limestone. I mean, if you do have a, a pressure hose, you can, you know, sort of with enough pressure, you can certainly carve um, through stone with water. It does have incredible cutting power. Um, they do have machines that using simply water pressure can cut through steel. And now I'm not claiming that that kind of pressure is involved in um, the Grand Canyon, but over, over a large amount of time, that channel becomes a, a, a ditch, that ditch becomes a, a much larger ditch and much larger. And eventually, you know, it turns into a ravine, which then turns into a canyon. It, it's not implausible at all. And current geological theory does support it. So I'm, I'm not sure why you would be incredulous to limestone specifically being cut through when water is used to cut all kinds of things. All right. Well, thanks for the question from One God is Now Here. Thanks for the response, Mark. And uh, Kent, this is the last question. So therefore, if you had anything you wanted to add, go ahead. Well, yes, I think there are giant canyons all over the world, and I think they're carved rapidly. Once water starts moving, it picks up debris and it becomes liquid sandpaper. So you get not only the erosion factor, you get the abrasion factor. If it's moving fast enough, you get liquefaction and cavitation. So I think there are quite a few phenomena of rapidly moving water that are fairly well understood. Anybody has a boat propeller and understands about cavitation pits from rapidly moving material through the water. So I think all the canyons, could, Grand Canyon could have been formed in a week with those factors, not just erosion, but uh, abrasion. It's picking up debris running with it, cavitation, liquefaction. So I think the Bible says the scoffers are ignorant of the flood and uh, the Grand Canyon is an example of all the canyons. Most of the canyons in the world probably formed pretty rapidly as the flood water was running off into its current basins. Okay. All right. I appreciate that, Kent. Uh, Mark, a quick final word, and then uh, we're going to start wrapping it up. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. So it's interesting. It was, Kent and I basically do agree that it could water could have made it through this this uh, rock layers. You know that. So we do agree. We just disagree on the nature and the speed at which it happened. I think that it's it's uh, completely implausible to think that you know the seven foot thick limestone could be carved through in a week, regardless of how much water or how much sediment is in it it just is completely implausible however you know it's nice to know we do agree that water can carve through rock um, but you know really my my uh, uh, claim is that it would have taken millions of years which is a lot more plausible for seven foot thick limestone than than a week all right. Well, thank you. That wraps up the Q&A. Tons of fun. This was a great debate. We've had a great chat and uh, you guys really made for an epic must watch uh, debate on Noah's Ark and Noah's Flood. So before we shut it down, I want to just hand it to you guys. I want to say thank you again. We went nearly we went two hours. So I want to thank you for giving us your time. Uh, great endurance from the both of you. Any final words, uh, final thoughts before we shut it down? We can start with you, uh, Dr. Hoven. I'm sorry. Start with me. Yeah. Okay. Any, any final sure. words? 
Well, I believe the Bible is true. I believe God made everything in six days. That's the only way creation is going to work. I believe there was a flood that destroyed everything. I believe the flood story is true. I believe Jesus came, died on the cross, and rose from the dead. And if you don't have him as your Savior, you're going to hell. That's what the Bible says. I don't want that for anybody. But that's what's going to happen. So I'd like to see everybody trust Jesus Christ as their Savior and get born again and become an independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical Baptist when it's over. Okay? Thank you. And thanks for giving us your time. Kent. Mark, any final words? Uh, thank you as well for giving us your time for tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Sam, to provide a blast. Thank you so much, Kent. Uh, pleasure to, to meet you and talk to you. Um, and I really do want to thank the audience for for listening in and giving me their time and and sort of hearing me out. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in God. I do believe in morality. I do believe in secular humanism. Um, there's a lot of things I, I, I do believe, even though I don't believe in the Bible. Um, I, I'm not convinced by any threats. I'm not convinced by any sort of... Um, um, uh, promises of, of punishment or anything like it. What I'll be convinced by is uh, fact and evidence and um, good reasoning. And um, yeah, I, I really do hope uh, I, I do see um, some some of that at some point that would convince me. But until then, I would have to say that I see no reason to believe in the claims presented to me. But uh, thank you so much for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. Amy's after show is always wonderful. Um, they're very theist friendly. So, um, you know, do come along if you if you do have the time or inclination. All right. Well, thank you for those final words, Mark. Thanks as well. Uh, Ken, epic debate. Reminder to the audience, we're going to be back here again tomorrow night, 8 o'clock, Matt Powell versus Dr. Kenny Rhodes, Old Earth Creation versus Young Earth Creation. So the fun continues. That being said, uh, thanks again to the audience. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Kent. And Standing for Truth is out. <laughs>